everyone, Bernard here. I hope you're all staying safe and well. And welcome to the Citizen Channel. And a, a new feature, yes, a new feature. We call him Managing City, yeah, where we have a look back at uh, some of the city managers. How many we're going to get through in all this time? I don't know. I mean, there may, may not be enough time to do it, might there? All the, all the ones we've had over the years. But uh, yeah, all, from the legends to the not so legends to the guys who did a good job to the Guys who are absolute failures, let's be honest about it. Uh, looking back in hindsight, uh, we can say that. And some of them we actually knew were going to be failures before they actually took over. Obviously, some of the older ones and some of the older, uh, some of the newer managers, if you like, respectively. Um, but today we're going to have a look, look at an interesting one, actually. Um, yeah, before uh, Joe Mercer and Malcolm Allison came, of course, you had a, a, guy, a guy called George Henry Poiser in charge, we'll just call him George, po George Poiser, we won't call him his Sunday name today. So in episode one, we're going to have a look at his very brief stay as manager. He was with City a little bit longer, obviously in, in a different uh, role. But we're going to have a look at uh, George Poiser today, so please enjoy and uh, let me know if there's any... I know some of you are a little bit older than me as well, so you may have memories of George Poiser. George Poiser, I don't really have any, to be honest with you. I went, I saw my first season was this, uh, when the season after he got he got uh, sacked or resigned. Let's be honest, <laughs> most managers resign these days, don't they? But uh, there you are, those days and these days. Anyway, so we're going to have a look at that. So any comments you've got to make, please do so. Please, if you're new to the channel, push that subscribe button, push the bell notification if you enjoy what we do. I try and inform and entertain as we go through these things. You'll also see stuff on my film and TV channel, so if that's any, just have a look at that, or if you know somebody who might be interested, you want to have a break from football. Links on screen for Facebook and Twitter, so if you follow a friend me on there, I do check every couple of days and follow and friend everyone back. And of course, all as I said, all your comments are welcome on, on Mr. Poiser, or, or anything else you want to talk about City, yeah, it's always welcome. It's it's nice to get new guys commenting and, and adding their thoughts, and I try and I try and reply to every every comment I get. Right, please, no chance to comment, just give us a thumbs up. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm sort of struggling to get 20 likes for these city ones, so if you can just do it now, it takes a split second. And obviously, it's nice to get views, but it's nice to get a little thumbs up, you feel a bit more appreciated. Right, born 6th of February 1910, yeah, 1910, uh, from Mansfield. There you go, from Mansfield. Uh, he liked, uh, George Poyser liked a, a sort of scout around the country, he liked, liked travelling, he, he was big into travelling, and... Uh, and as an assistant manager to Les McDowell, uh, he did some mileage up and down the country seeking out uh, talent for City. Yeah, he come up with some uh, good names over the years. I mean, his six years alongside McDowell hadn't tainted his reputation at all when he was asked to take over the manager role. I think McDowell was there about 13 years or something like that. Uh, perhaps if the board had been braver and looked elsewhere. There's no doubt that uh, Poyser would have would have stayed on in a capacity at City. He was good at what he did. Uh, as I say, as assistant manager, as actually scouting around the country, he covered a lot of miles. He was actually good at that. So if the board had not uh, looked to George po Poyser as a safe pair of hands, uh, there's no doubt he would have carried on scouting for City over many years. I think I don't think there's any possibility that he would have left the club. He'd had previous managerial experience at, uh, at Dover Town, uh, very briefly, and Notts County, yeah, Notts County had taken uh, this, this team to the FA Cup quarter-finals in 1955, uh, I think he joined City about 1957 or something like that. Um, so he'd, he'd done an okay job, uh, yeah, with Notts County, and his playing career, he was, he was a defender, he was, he was a left-back. He's actually won a second division title uh, with Brentford back in nineteen thirty four thirty five, and the three the three seasons after that where he played, they would actually finish in the top six of the first division consistently for three seasons. Uh, as I'm recording this, they've obviously been uh, promoted back to the Premier League, but uh, as I say, that was uh, when they were actually in 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 the top division at that stage, and they made a good fist of it. I say with uh, it, it was a no mess no messing left back. He was you know it was just simple, and you weren't in those days. I mean, even when I was at school. In the sixties, I played right back, and you had to do a job. I mean, no, there's no uh, no cleverness in that job. You just stuck stuck to your wingers and tried to do a job. Uh, he was actually inducted into the Brentford Hall of Fame quite recently in 2018. So there you go. Obviously, there's a lot still a lot of uh, love out there for uh, this uh, Georgian at uh, Brentford. He also turned out to play for Port Vale and briefly for Plymouth Argyle. Uh, the appointment at the time, you know, Alan Douglas was the city chairman at the time, and he explained the appointment, citing that uh, Poison knew the playing staff well. He did. I mean, as I said, he, although he wasn't 
he wasn't hands on. We'll discover that later. He, he knew the playing staff well. He knew the strengths as a scout, as that was his main thing, as what he was good at. He knew their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and of course, uh, when I, when offered the job, I'm not sure he had to think too long and hard about it. As I say, he he, he did he did tell the board or convince the board of cl claiming that oh, the board say this, and I've no I've no proof that George Poyser said this, but uh, that he knew that where we could strengthen. And uh, he should have. He should be able to take City back into the first division, which I say we, we didn't want to be a bit of a yo-yo club at the time. But uh, it was uh, it was a bad time. But we'll go on to that a little bit more in the moment. Uh, though a popular figure with City fans, I think he was uh, as assistant uh, to to McDowell at the time. Uh, this appointment, yeah, it wasn't exactly uh, sort of to say it received a lukewarm reaction. I think that's what we can say from the City fans. They weren't overly impressed. I mean, don't forget some other clubs. We'll mention some names later. Uh, we're getting some quite charismatic uh, managers and doing good things. But uh, yeah, as far as City are concerned, after 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 McDowell, perhaps they needed a little bit. Felt they needed a bit more of a change and not to not to just appoint his assistant to to the job. Um, both strikers, Dobin and Harley, yeah, it's not just the fans were a bit despondent, but they were equally unimpressed. I mean, they were sort of stalwarts of City's attack at the time, and although we'd just been relegated, these guys quickly jumped ship with the appointment of Mr. Poyser. Uh, and to the dissatisfaction of the City fans, Ed Dobin and Harley, whether it's Poyser's appointment or the fact they just didn't want to play for a team in the second division, well, we'll never proper know, but they're, they're the two guys who've sort of led City's attack and they jumped ship very quickly, uh, Dobin and Harley. Uh, it did appear a thankless task as he took on a, a role of a manager of City, just relegated, but the fans had started to desert City in the in the droves. Um, we possibly, I mean, you think back to the night, late 1990s and, and obviously down to the third tier but this this in itself at this period in time was probably our lowest lowest point and, and sort of matched that really matched that later time uh it's probably uh, united has started to you know well they have been winning things obviously united have become the the big club after the second world war city had struggled along they'd done all right in the 50s but by the 60s we were struggling and the, and the crowds and uh, were dwindling you know we've gone from one of the best supported teams in the country and we were struggling just a little bit uh to get the fans through the gate so it wasn't it was a bit of a thankless task he took over to be honest with you uh, since that time uh, yeah his scouting prowess so of course was always going to be good that was going to change was he was still going to be able to pick up good players uh, in his first season 63-64 which obviously was his only only full season as it turned out he made two good signings uh, Derek Kevin and Jimmy Murray who uh, obviously came and were scoring plenty of goals yeah I mean injury to Jimmy Murray in, the, in that season obviously started to put a bit of a dampener on the season as far as the City was concerned uh, but we actually made it to the semi-final of the fairly new at that time fairly new league cup uh, uh not much is spoken about this yeah and we lost over two legs to stoke city we lost two uh we lost two nil at their place uh, i think it was the victoria ground at the time and we actually beat them at uh, main road at one nil but unfortunately with a bit of two leg semi-final we lost two on an aggregate so we missed the opportunity of getting to a final, though it was a two-legged final in those days. It wasn't a Wembley appearance, but uh, he did play a home and a home and away leg in the final. So we just about in his first season missed out on that, and some, as I said, some early promise in the league sort of started to peter out at the turn of the year, and obviously a bad run in January and February put an end to any hopes of a promotion push as far as the city is concerned. And say we did have a, I think uh, Jimmy Murray picked up a, a bad injury as well, so that affected it. Although we did manage, uh, he did manage to get us into a sixth place, but uh, that was a good seventeen points behind the second division title winners, uh, Leeds United, under a certain, uh, yeah, certain gentleman Don Revy that gets another mention later. But yeah, so uh, yeah, sixth place wasn't a total disaster, but uh, uh, again, the crowds. Well, <laughs> we'll soon see the next season what what effect it was going to have. Uh, another season in the second division. Um, I mean, the opposite to the to the accomplishment of him bringing the the players in. Of course we mentioned the two earlier the two guys earlier uh, Dobin and Harley but uh, uh, what also angered uh, City fans was the leaving of uh, David Wagstaff at the time who, who who himself had said he would have loved to have played under Mercer and Allison, who obviously were a, a season or two away but uh, yeah I mean that, that angered so some of the some of the leave, some of the players leaving did anger the City fans 
and he certainly wasn't a hand, hands-on manager. Uh, he was never really out on the training pitch or anything like that. Uh, and it was sort of obviously sat in his office uh, smoking his familiar pipe. It's very most, I think there's a, an image we've seen as well where he's actually got the pipe in his hand. But uh, yeah, it wasn't very often. And some of the players commented that he always seemed to have a, a pipe in his mouth, a pipe, a pipe in his mouth. So he wasn't a sort of hands-on. But he did preside, he did make the decision to to uh, interesting one with Harry Dowell. He scored one goal for Manchester City. He did make that decision in February 1964, where he played, uh, obviously, an injury to Harry Dowell's hand and forced him to play out. He swapped goalkeepers and, of course, he equalised a Colin Bell goal against Berry at, uh, at main role. So at least he did preside over that decision. So that was quite an interesting decision and something we remember to this day. Um, yeah, but uh, all right, David Wagstaff apart. He did, again, brought in some two very good players for the 64-65 season. Yeah, he brought in uh, David B Dave Bacuzzi and Johnny Crossan, of course. Johnny Crossan will go on to lift the, the second division title for City, obviously. Uh, but so that was another good additions to the squad. But again, we, we suffered a little bit unlucky. We suffered with injuries to key players and we never really got going that 1964-65 season. Um, we had early exits from the Cups, which was disappointing. Poor displays in the league, which, as I said, the crowd, the crowd were vaulting with defeat. And to add insult to injury, that season, of course, saw our lowest, even to this day, our lowest competitive league uh, crowd. Uh, we nearly matched it on the last day of the season. Actually, it was only a couple of hundred more on the last day of the season, but uh, uh, obviously under another manager, he wasn't there by then. But uh, we saw the lowest league crowd on January the 16th, 1965, when a crowd of just 8,015 turned up uh, for a match against Swindon. Yeah, where Mr. Mr. Summerby was playing for Swindon as well. So there you go, that wasn't too bad was it I mean, he, he didn't he didn't put him off did it obviously but uh, and ironically uh, George Poyser wasn't even at the game I mean he wasn't even at this game he was actually uh, although he got a bit of stick he was actually scouting he was actually trying to look at a new player for City so even though he wasn't he wasn't even actually there that was the lowest crowd on record there were reasons for it but uh, yeah gen generally the City fans weren't, weren't very happy at the time an elastic attempt, even George Poyser, even elastic, he knew, he knew the writing was probably on the wall. And he even turned up uh, and took part in a training session, which he doesn't do in his tracksuit. Uh, but obviously by that time he'd lost, he'd lost all uh, respect from the players and indeed some openly laughed at him and, and poked fun at him when he, when he took a training session. Uh, Mike Doyle had just broken into the team at the time and he actually commented and was shocked by the lack of uh, respect shown to the manager at the time. But uh, that's just how bad it, was, it, was got, it, it got by that stage. Uh, as it was, he was uh, Poise wasn't able to sort of keep on with those training sessions and keep the keep the guys on side, the team on side, uh, and so by the Easter, he'd actually resigned. Probably pushed, uh, probably pushed. He probably jumped. Uh, probably jumped before he was pushed to be honest with you but uh, by the Easter uh, ex-player Fred Tilson had took over temporary charge although I think the team was probably picked and run by committee at the time I don't think it was Tilson on his own but he was he was classed as a caretaker manager uh, yeah, so there was it. Yeah, that was the end of Poyser's as city as city connection. There, I mean, he presided over eighty nine games in charge of City, won thirty eight, uh, drew seventeen, and lost thirty four. So he won more than he lost. Uh, he scored one hundred and fifty nine goals and let in one hundred and thirty seven. So not a total disaster. Uh, but uh, of course, all those games were in the second tier. They weren't in the at the top level. I mean, I thought in in conclusion, I thought I think George did a good job uh, in his time at City. Not necessarily as the manager, although his first season a little, uh, if he had a little bit more, a little bit more luck. Uh, who knows? I mean, we won that semi final against Stoke, or he hadn't had a couple of injuries that we got. Um, he may have done a little bit better. I mean, as far as the the board were concerned at this time of McDowell uh, leaving, he was a safe pair of hands and. Uh, it's no doubt he made his best, the best fist of it. He tried his best for the club, um, and as I said, with a little bit more luck, he would have would have been a little bit more set, successful. But I think even then, even though even then in '63, these sort of less hands on. Uh, less coach, let's say they're not really coaches, are they? They're more the more managers picking a team and and leading from from their own uh, manager's office. They don't actually get out there and get their hands dirty. But uh, I think at that stage, more uh, more hands-on managers were coming. 
uh, more charismatic managers were appearing, and obviously I don't think George Poyser would ever ever figure in that category, as you could see by the way the players there uh, treated him. Uh, you had people, of course, Matt Busby's United were doing wonderful things, uh, and they were going to get even better. Of course, we mentioned before the uh, uh, Don Revy, didn't we? He was doing it, starting to do a great job at Leeds, uh, and obviously as an ex-City player, it would have been to see if he got, you know, if we'd give him a go at some stage, wouldn't it? That all right? <laughs> His career didn't end fantastically many years later. To, but at the time, it would have been interesting if City had uh, the board had took a chance on Don Revy or convinced Don Revy to come back to City, stuff like that. And of course, you have people like Shankly who would certainly come and start making their mark on on football. So yeah, I think it changed a little bit, and uh, I think the City board, uh, the City board had realised this, and obviously it was a bit of a stop. I think the two years turned into a bit of a stop gap, and I think obviously the City had an eye on another manager, didn't they? Uh, someone called Joe, who, uh, who though not in the best of health at the time, uh, would also probably have an ideal foil uh, lined up to join him at Main Road and a certain other gentleman wanted to, uh, you know, so I think the City Board had, had the thoughts on that and obviously we would then join the, the sort of group of these managers and coaches that would uh, propel City onto another level, fortunately. But, hey, those guys, those guys are another Managing City episode, aren't they? We're talking about George Poyser today. Uh, he sadly passed away, George Poyser, on the 30th of January, 1995. There you go. So, if you any comments, any memories of yourself, as I said, is it a little bit, just a little bit before my time, uh, Mr. Poyser, but uh, all respect him. I think I think he did an okay job for City. He did an excellent job on the scouting side, etc., etc. So, I think we can all think, uh, uh, I think he earns our respect, really. I think uh, I think he goes down, say, only with us briefly as a manager, but uh, highly respected as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure, I'm sure most City fans, based on, on what we know and what, what we've seen on, on Mr. Poyser. Anyway, thanks for watching. What are you going to do this day? Have a great one. Look after yourselves, look after your friends, look after your families. More importantly, let's all look after each other. Till we meet here again on the Citizen channel, or perhaps you have a flit across, have a look at my film and TV channel. I only ask one thing of you. Please stay safe, Blues. Come on, City. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.